Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm Tokiko Bazel, Japan Studies Librarian at the University of Hawaii at the Manoa Library. Uh, I'm here today to talk to Dr. Patricia Steinhoff. She is a sociology professor emeritus at the University of Hawaii at the Manoa. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us to interview you for the NCC's Multimedia History Project. It's said that research and resources go hand in hand. Successful researchers like yourself need to work closely with the people who develop and manage resources to create a synergy. But the notion of creating synergy is easier to say than to pull off in practice. But many of my library colleagues agree that you are one of the best at it. <laughs> and my, my colleagues have said that you have a knack for asking questions that spark our information drawers, so to speak. So, to get started, could you tell us about your background? I especially appreciate your sharing what role you think your early experience contributed to the development of your skills in relation to your information seeking activities, your interactions with information specialists such as librarians and archivists, and organizations such as NCC. Okay, I'll go, I'll dig deep first. Um, my earliest sense of encounters with librarians and libraries um, was when I was in the fourth grade. We moved at that time, and we moved to a house that was a block and a half from the public library in Highland Park. And I was already a voracious reader. I had started reading very early, and I was an only child, so reading was a part of my daily life. And the library was a block and a half away, so I could walk over. And every week, I took home a stack of books and read them and brought them back and got another stack. So the librarian knew me well, and that library was a home for me. At some time after that, I had a, a during school job in my elementary school. I can't remember what grade it was, but other people were in the safety patrol and after lunch they had to go on, make sure the streets were safe. But my job was to go to the library and help the librarian. And what I did basically was reshelve books. <laughs> and wow. I, it made me a whiz at alphabetizing. <laughs> okay, I know the alphabet very well. <laughs> Um, and I'm trying to remember whether they also had nonfiction books under a Dewey dec Decimal System, um, because I probably learned that too at that time, okay? So that's my earliest sense of, yes, librarians are there to help you, libraries are wonderful places, and I always had that sense about it. Wow, that's interesting. So move on to the next level then. You know, you actually said uh, your early age, you already have experience with the librarians and yeah. library and books. So do you really think that shaped the way you are, you know, how you actually seek for information and to get help? I think so, because I was also reading a lot of nonfiction when I was using the public library at that time. And I would go on, you know, a quest to, I was doing archaeology for a while and, and all kinds of different things, yoga, um, books about it. So I already was trying to get information from books. Mm -hmm. So that has always been part of my life. So do you think that your ability, you know, I said you're one of the best, <laughs> you know, among us too. Uh, do you think that your ability can be taught or learned from early age? Well, I think it uh, certainly is a, it's a learned skill, but I think I'm a sociologist, so only part of what I learn for research comes from libraries and librarians. Much of it comes from interviews and participant observation. So part of what I have learned is how to ask questions 
And it, whether I'm asking a question to elicit an answer from an interview re respondent, or whether I'm asking a librarian to find something, I think it's the same skill. It's how do you ask a question that forces the other person to dig deep into what they know and then respond? That's that's it. Because when I always <laughs> talk to you, and you, I totally forgot about something. But your question actually uh, dig into my memory. <laughs> and then uh, you know i can find the uh some resources that you yeah. are looking for and it's a truly uh your ideal researcher that i wanted to talk to <laughs> oh my I, well thank you very I, much <laughs> because uh you know as a librarian uh hardest thing is to try to find out the users what they are looking for right you know sometimes they don't know but even you know they don't know and they can't they don't know how to put the you know question into in such a way that you know we together can find yeah. some, something useful well that's very interesting so early age you know i experience with the library and librarians are very good great okay um i attended your retirement lecture in a year ago right in april mm -hmm. 2019 that covered more than 50 years of your distinguished career as a sociologist. And in your lecture, I believe that the title is Serendipity and Sociology, Five Decades of Study in Japanese Sociology, you talked about the role of serendipity. Yes. And I feel this applies to information discovery too. What do you think of that? Absolutely. I think a lot of what we find is serendipitous. And those are the most interesting things because neither side was expecting it. Um, but I, and I think <laughs> serendipity is not something you learn, but you can learn how to use it. Uh -huh. And I think it is true that um, if you are primed to be acquiring new information, then when something happens, you can make use of it. You can figure out, oh, this is interesting, I need to pursue this, or this is potentially interesting. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't happen all at once. And one thing that we teach um, when we're teaching students how to do interviews um, is that you ask a question and you get an answer. And then you go on to the next question. And maybe 10 minutes later, the respondent says something to you that is actually a response to the question you asked earlier. OK? So I always teach people to read the interview lengthwise and not just by the question, because the answer sometimes comes in another context. Um, so that, that's a learned skill. And you have to be aware that the what you're looking for could come someplace not where you expect it. So if you are narrowly assuming this is where the information is, this is what I ask, this is what I get, you'll miss the fact that half an hour later, somebody is telling you something highly relevant to what you were interested in earlier. Okay? Same thing happens with participant observation, where you are observing live settings as they unfold in front of you, okay? And there's a famous um, sociologist who deals with very micro scale interaction. And I can't remember the exact quote, I have it on my office wall, but he says, you don't necessarily understand what you're seeing and hearing at the time you see it and hear it. It's later you realize, oh, that was <laughs> what I was looking for. And then you have to go back and understand what the context was and how it happened. Okay, so that is a learned skill. And I'm not sure that everybody learns it, but it is learned. Ah. Do you see any um, researchers who are naturally good at it, or they can train themselves to be closer to your level? <laughs> Well, I don't know that my level is so special, but I've worked with a lot of graduate students. Mm -hmm. And yes, 
they can learn to do it. Um, and they do. And a lot of it is just practice in getting used to the way in which information comes. Another aspect of it, which comes from my interviewing experience, is that students learn a lot of theory. And when they start doing their own research, they ask questions that are in the theoretical terms. Well, nobody in the real world knows those terms and can answer that. And I suspect that a lot of the questions you get that are hard to understand are because the person is asking in terms of a theoretical framework, okay? So you have to teach people, forget that. You're gonna ask questions in plain English and that's the kind of answer you're gonna get. And then your job is to translate it into the theory if you wanna do that, but that's a separate operation. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> from my experience, say I used to uh, teach a bibliography course and uh, some of the students uh, think that uh, all information can come out of uh, online, <laughs> online <laughs> environment. So I assign the students to walk through aisles of books. <laughs> and right. then, uh, you know, if you have something in your mind, you know, we are looking for something, you know, just walk and yeah. look and read uh, spines of those books. And at first, you know, they are very skeptical about that. <laughs> but I said, uh, you know, books sometimes can call you, <laughs> you know, yes. I'm here. <laughs> and then after the semester is, was over, so many students actually say that was true. You yes. know, they actually, something in their mind and looking just, yes. you know, find the books, they actually found something they are looking for. Yes. Or they couldn't see it before. Yeah. So uh, that probably, you know, very close to that, what you're saying. Yeah. That. So, yeah. Great. Great. Uh, yeah. You studied at the University of Michigan and uh, uh, Tokyo University during an interesting time period. And I learned that you had access to the previously classified administrative documents. And so yes. Forth. Can you describe your thoughts or feelings when you first accessed such information? Okay. Um, that happened at Todai, where I was affiliated with the Institute of Social Science. And they had a wonderful librarian, Oguro-san. And he had been collecting these pre-war and wartime um, government documents that had turned up in the, the um, secondhand book market after the war. And they had all these marks on them that they were top secret or secret. Um, and so the only reason I had any access initially to that is because he had collected it and it was right in the Institute's library where all of these wonderful things. And it was quite amazing to read them and realize, okay, the government was keeping this secret during the war. And this was material that was about the pre-war um, Tenko um, where the communists were arrested and then they were pressured to change their ideas. And so all of that material, the, the uh, reports of the, the um, thought procurators and the whole organization that was built up to deal with it, that was all there. And it was interesting to see those marks on the, on the books and be able to do it. After a while, I also learned that I could go down the hill to Kanda and go to the used bookstores. And there were some there where you would often find another one of these old documents. So I have the experience of finding them myself, but initially I was very much helped because the librarian at the Institute had been collecting that material. Yeah. And in that context, I wanna say something else, which is when I came to the University of Hawaii, for a long time, I did not expect the librarians to be finding my research materials. I felt that what I was studying was so obscure and was not related to standard literature and history topics. And the librarians were collecting um, the standard stuff. So when they would say, well, what do you want me to look for? I would say, I don't expect you to find what I need. I have to find it myself because you don't know where to look 
and it's too specialized for you. It isn't stuff the library would want to hold. So in a sense, the Takazawa collection brought an individual collector's materials that are exactly what I needed into the library. But that, that's, that's another piece of serendipity because mm -hmm. there's no way that a librarian serving a large group of Japan specialists could be collecting what everybody needs. Okay, um, Pat just talked about the Takazawa collection at the University of Hawaii um, and a library. So this Takazawa, just kind of explain it very briefly. The Takazawa collection is a vast collection of primary sources about the post-war social movements in Japan. So that brought me uh, another question to ask. So um, how did you develop a close relationship with Takazawa? You know, that's uh, unbelievable, 75,000 pieces or items, you know, in, in this uh, uh, collection. So I'm so curious, how did you actually develop the close relationship? Okay, when I began studying the post-war movement, which was after my dissertation, um, and I went to Japan and I would ask people, you know, who knows anything, um, I would be sent, uh, several people sent me to, um, uh, a journalist who had been writing about the movement. And then they sent me to Takazawa, or the, the journalist sent me to him um, as an expert on the, the new left. And so at first I met him, he was quite suspicious, but um, he, <laughs> I clearly was interested in something he had a lot of knowledge about. And so he began lending me materials and I would take them to Todai and copy them and bring them back to him. And gradually he opened up. So after a while we became colleagues and um, when I would go to Japan from the 1980s on was when I was really doing that research on the ground. I would go to Japan every year aside from the years when I was in Japan for a year. And there were always three places I went. One was uh, the Mosaksha bookstore, which is an underground bookstore in Shinjuku that um, has, carries all these kinds of things and carries um, materials produced by the social movement that are there on consignment. I always went to the QNN Akusenta, which is the, support, the central support agency that supports uh, new left people who get arrested and provides their legal support and everything. And I would go to those two places, but I would also go to Takazawa's, he used to have an office that was in Shinjuku, just down the street from Mosaksha. And so by going to those three places, I could quickly catch up on everything that had happened since the last time I was in Japan. And he gradually began um, telling me more things and suggesting things. And um, at one point, I had been working on it and I was starting to write. And we were in Japan, we were at a Nijikai or something, and he said, you know, if you want to publish a book, because I would always say, well, when, they would say, when are you coming back to Japan? And I would say, the next time somebody pays for my airfare. And so he said, you know, if you write a book and we translate it into Japanese, that'll buy you a trip to Japan. So that offer then, when I had a manuscript, I gave it to him, and that's how my book ended up being published in Japanese, the book that's never been in English. I'm trying, I'm revising it now for English publication and expanding it. But, um, so he, at that point, after he saw what I had written, and he liked it, and he arranged for the publication, then, we became, in a sense, colleagues. And then shortly after that, um, he was giving up his office. It was a typical Japanese crowded office, bookcases, floor to ceiling, no place to walk, or barely a narrow channel where you could go back to where his desk was. And he was doing a lot of projects at that time. And he said he needed to clean things out. And he wanted to give his collection to some place that would use it. And he said he knew that Japanese libraries would not use it, that they would either throw it out, put it on the, 
the used book, send, sell it to the bookstores. Um, he tried, he had worked with the diet library and he said they would take it, but they would stick it in the, in the basement for 50 years and then they might look at it. So he was interested in the US because people were studying these topics. And he had, he was sort of interested, the one he knew about was the Stanford collection. And I said, uh, we can do this at Hawaii. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to do that? And since I was then director of the Center for Japanese Studies, I was in a position to make things happen. If I hadn't been in that position, I wouldn't have known what to do. But since I was in that position, I could do things to make it come to UH. And so that's what happened. Um, and after it came, then he came and we did a couple projects together and he was very interested in the collection and we were doing a lot of it together. Um, but then at a later point, he had a massive stroke and it was several years before he was functional again. And then we picked up more or less where we had left off. So uh, did you or he see yourself you're performing specific roles in relation to his collections themselves? Well, he was the expert on the materials. Uh -huh. I had developed through completely unrelated projects, I had developed the ability to um, create and to build um, Microsoft Access databases. And I understood relational databases and that that I got excited about them because that's the way I think. It's very complex and you know you have to have place to put all these things, but they aren't all of the same. So I knew how to do that. So when the collection came, I took responsibility for taking care of it because at that time, it came actually to the main library and to the center because at that time we had a Japanese librarian who was already ill and not very functional. And um, there was, we knew we couldn't, if we couldn't do anything through him. So I was already used to working around him. And so I managed to get it into Sinclair. John Hawk gave us space in Sinclair. And I knew that if I didn't take responsibility for it, it wouldn't happen. Okay. But I relied on his knowledge. And so for the first couple of years, when we cataloged the books first, and then when I would go to Japan, I would sit down in the International House um, lobby with him. I would bring a printout of the books or some part of them. And we would sit there. I would sit at one of those little desks. And we'd start with the first item. And he would say what he knew about that thing. And it was just amazing. There were at that time, there were about 1850 books in the thing. He knew all those books. He knew what was in them. He knew the people. He knew the backstories. So he would tell me that in Japanese. And I would sit at the, t the computer and write in, in English what he'd said. Okay. And then afterwards, <laughs> we developed it into the annotations. Okay, that worked for the books and the first part of the serials. Then he became ill and we had to finish the serials and other things by ourselves so they don't have the same depth. Mm -hmm. But I learned so much just from listening to him respond to each of those items. And he would tell me, oh, this, that's this guy's pen name. His real name is this and here's his background. So all of that stuff is in there for the, the annotations that he, that he dictated to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm very envious in a sense because sometimes we do have some uh, uh, archival collections coming into Hawaii. And uh, after the donor, uh, actual collector passed away. Mm -hmm. And all that knowledge is gone. Uh, yeah, gone. And I wish I could ask more questions when yeah. I try to organize the collections. And it's really yeah. nice that we can actually work together with a yeah. collector. Yeah. I have to throw uh, at you some uh, maybe difficult questions, <laughs> okay. okay? Because you said that um, first, the University of Tokyo, this librarian collected very amazing, uh, you know, yes. classified documents. 
and uh, you found out they have it. So that is very, very helpful, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you mentioned that you do not expect the librarians to find and uh, resources that you know specifically need yes. your research. Is, is that a little bit, uh, you know, different? <laughs> you know, what you're saying. He was a librarian at a specialized research institute. Ah. And there were people there who were interested in those issues ah. or related issues. So he knew what he was doing, but he also, he was not the main librarian at a main Todai library. Ah. He was a librarian at the Institute of Social Science. And so he, if, you know, the scholars there had particular social science interests. Mm -hmm. um, Ishida Takeshi was there and he was my advisor at the time. So he was interested in not the specifics of what I was interested in, but the general area. And so there were a lot of scholars there who were interested. So as a specialized librarian for that institute, he was collecting those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I see. That leads to my next question too, okay? Um, like um, in recent decades too, yes. especially, uh, librarians have, uh, have assumed uh, primary responsibility for collection development and the management. You know, librarians mean like me, <laughs> you know, yes. Japan yes. studies librarian. So your case is, you know, to me, it's very, very interesting. You actually, you know, took full responsibility to develop, organize, manage, and disseminate the Takatawa collection. But working within the library, I understand that at that time, uh, Japan Studies librarian was ill, so you didn't expect that uh, you could go through him. But nonetheless, you actually worked with the library, and uh, within the library, you established this, you know, very specific yeah. uh, collection. So, uh, would you like to kind of say something about how the researchers found something? how those researchers can work with the library, like our library, you know, like a general library. We don't have a mm -hmm. special library. Right, right. Do you, do you have any ideas or, you know, thoughts about that? Okay, well, I think, first of all, Japanese studies has changed a great deal over the last 50 years. And nowadays, um, since about the 1990s, there's been much more interest, not in the classics, and the standard resources which the libraries now have and which is where librarians assumed was what they had to fill the collection with. But people are interested in popular culture, they're interested in what appeared in magazines, and for pre-war Japan, those things have been collected and there are nice library sets of them that you can buy but for more recent things that's not the case and so as with me people have to go out and find them in where they arise in japan okay and so there are a couple of big collections in japan that do collect ma popular magazines and those kinds of things or more specialized like labor things those sorts of things so there are places in Japan where some collections exist and some of this is material is available and a lot of the women's material has been developed through women's centers and things like that. So there are resources but because people are much more working now with primary materials mm -hmm. and with primary materials that are often ephemeral, mm -hmm. okay, so we can't expect that the Japan librarian at a particular institution can collect all of that stuff. They wouldn't know where to look and it's not their job. It's our job as researchers. And we develop contacts with the people who would know how to get them, okay? So um, that's beyond what I would expect the librarian to do. It's, and to a certain extent, that's a social science question because um, in, History and in literature, they are more grounded in the standard resources. But even there, I think people are increasingly dealing with ephemeral materials. So I think there are some examples now in the US 
of places where a library has built a collection, a special collection, because of the kinds of researchers they had at their institution. Okay, I'm thinking of um, the Ohio Library where there's a collection of shashi um, and other company resources because they had people who were studying those things. Okay, so it may be that a particular library can collect some materials because they have strength in their faculty and the faculty member needs those things. But beyond that, I think as people develop these, their own resources, they may at some point be finished with them. And if the librarian knows what they've been doing and knows what kinds of materials they've collected, um, there might be an opportunity to get those things into the library. I mean, at UH, we have uh, several collections mm -hmm. that were created by people who were doing research in Japan earlier and brought back. That's why we have an Okinawa collection and we have various things, as you know. So there are possibilities, but that requires that the librarian is open to that kind of thing and can handle it if it comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand. And uh, the, you know, the library, libraries now value much more ephemera and the primary yes. process because that truly distinguish uh, that each library's collections. So I'm so glad that you did that, you know, the collection yes. and uh, some other things. So yes. we uh, started paying more attention to those collections as well. Well, I just wanted to switch gears a little bit. I'm, I'm going to come back to this similar uh, in a question later. But I want to talk about you are also well known for the directory of Japanese studies uh, commissioned by the Japan Foundation. Mm -hmm. You uh, complied and analyzed the status and uh, future trend or direction of Japanese studies in North America. So I'm so curious, uh, how did you get involved in this very important <laughs> Okay. Again, that was a major example of serendipity. Okay. Oh. <laughs> in the late 1980s, I happened to be on the um, the uh, American Advisory Committee for the Japan Foundation. And I was also then the, um, I, at the AAS, I was the chair of the Northeast Asia Committee. And at that time, I was stuck with that for a three year period and it happened to overlap with the other one. And um, the person who was the Japan um, head of the American Advisory Committee. At the party or anything after the meeting, he said, oh, they've asked me to produce a Mabel. I don't know where to start. I don't know anything about it. So I said, I'm a sociologist. I know how to collect data. Um, and I am, have these connections with, and I'm very interested, have long been interested in what's happened in Japanese studies. So I volunteered. So I said I would do it and he was, oh, okay. So he contacted the people in Tokyo and they basically gave me carte blanche. And the first one, um, and I, I, I said, it should be US and Canada because the two groups were intertwined and I felt it should be North America. And they said, oh, okay. Um, and so then they gave me some money and initially I did the first one through um, the AAS because I had an affiliation there at the time and I knew the staff. And so they, they housed the grant and I used their resources. And the biggest piece of serendipity is they gave me their programmer to use for this project. And the programmer was using, at that time, all big relational databases were um, mainframe databases and it was programmers who knew how to program them. So he had developed, he had used one called RBase and that's what he had was, the whole AAS was running on his RBase database. Okay, so I had access to their mailing lists, 
which was at that time a big chunk of Japanese studies. It's less so now, but at that time it was still a major part. And so we sat down to talk about what, what I would need and how he could do it. And he explained to me how a relational database works and that you can put the pieces together from different things and they're connected. And I said, wow, that's how I think. So that was total serendipity, but that meant that I could do what I wanted to do to build that, that study. So it included librarians as one component, um, scholars, and um, institutions, the programs. So those were the three separate components of it, and they had to be linked together, and we used each one to make sense of the others. Um, so I was able to do it because he showed me how relational databases work. And in, for the first one, he programmed it, and it was on the AAS's computer system. Um, and uh, in that process, we and they sent out the um, the surveys. We used the programs to collect data from individuals. They distributed it to their specialists and that to their librarians. So that one worked, and we put it all together. And um, because it was in a relational database to begin with, it was very easy to reformat it for publication. So that whole process, I learned that process through doing that once with him. When I did that one, um, because I, the reason I was volunteering to do it was because I was interested in what was in the information. And so when we were putting it together to publish, I couldn't resist. I wrote a long methodological explanation of how we did it, which I put in an appendix. And then I had a long editor's introduction in which I did a very simple analysis of the data. Okay. And so that satisfied my curiosity about the materials. And then it went out. Well, the Japan Foundation was very happy with it. And then they came back a couple of years later and said, okay, we want you to do it again. And we want you to write another whole separate volume to analyze the data. So from then on, I was in business <laughs> and I dealt with them in that way. Okay. And the other thing is that um, with the second one, which was done in the early 1990s, just when we finished collecting the data for that, uh, Microsoft put out its office suite and it had access in it. And that was designed to be user-friendly relational database. So I talked to the programmer there and he said, well, we could, if he could take the R-based data, convert it to D-based format and access could read the D-based format. So we were able, I was able for that second one to get all the data so that I could deal with it. And I very much depended upon programmers and I love them dearly and I've worked with a lot of them, but I really wanted to be able to do it myself. And so as of the early 1990s when Access came out, I could do that and think through and work it out myself. And that was a big step forward for me too. Yeah, I remember because uh, very well uh, from the librarian's point of view, uh, we can see the trend of scholarship, you know, yeah. where the scholarship yes. is going. So when I was the NCC chair, I invited you to talk about, you know, your analysis yeah. for our next several years, I think. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, observation. So I just wanted to ask you, because you are engaged in this very important work, what are your observations about the future of Japanese studies, scholars, <laughs> information specialists, and the resources available to them? Okay, every time I do a study and I finish it, the Japan Foundation is always asking me, well, what's going to happen in five years? And I keep saying, I don't know, because I only know when I have data and I can see what's happening in the data, okay? And I quickly found that as I moved from one study to the next one, that uh, we had this long 
library-based cataloging system of defining what your specializations were. And we had a place always, of course, for people to add other things. And in the second study, I discovered that what people had put in as the extras were what, what was happening next. So we added those to the list for the next one. So I also was using what people told me about their work in progress to see where it was going. And that's the only way I know it. <laughs> There's no magic to it, okay? If you have a lot of data, you can see a lot of things. Okay, uh, you've worked with a variety of librarians and institutions over a year, mm -hmm. um, you know, great span of uh, time. And at times uh, that helped and sometimes hindered uh, yours and uh, others' abilities to conduct research, I, I assume. So could you characterize some of your good and bad ex experiences and how these uh, shape your approach and uh, philosophy about uh, research? Well, I always assumed I had to do it myself, okay? I had to go to where the expertise was and learn from other people, but it was my responsibility to do it. So I never thought that the librarians were supposed to collect stuff for me or that I could rely on somebody else for the information I needed. Um, so that's always been, that's the scholar's responsibility is to collect what they need, to figure out what they need, and to make use of what is available to them. And there's always stuff that you can't get that would be nice, and stuff that you don't even know about that would be even nicer. Um, but you, it's, Research is always a process of collecting what's possible and then um, figuring out what's, what it means and making sense of it. And so you always know that you don't have everything, it's not perfect, and that your conclusions are based on what you can see and what you have. So I would never claim that, you know, that I have it all or that that's possible. Um, in Japan, I mostly would not work, a, the first project was pre-war, and so the stuff was in Shaken Library. But after that, I was working on post-war things, and there were books around, but, um, and there were organizations, but it wasn't collected, and it wasn't in libraries. Librarians had no idea that this stuff existed in a lot of cases, okay? So my job was to find where it was and to collect it from the places that had it. So that's why I always went to Mosaksha because that was a very special underground bookstore that worked directly with the publishers of political titles. And the, the main distribution system for books in Japan, as you know, goes through these two or three very large distributors and most bookstores just have a standing order and those distributors send them stuff. They keep it for six months and then if they couldn't sell it, they give it back. Well, these little publishers on the left would take their books to the distributors and the distributor might take, oh, I'll take 10 copies or 15, but they wouldn't take the whole print run. And so those people were distributing it through underground bookstores and other places and, and direct sales to people. But so they often had them for a very long time. So Mushaksha dealt with those, those publishers and the authors, and they would carry stuff that was not in other places. So once I knew to go to Mushaksha, I knew where to find the books and also the publications that the groups were putting out. But from QN, I also, part of my research over time involved people who'd been well, a lot of it involved people who'd been arrested and who were in the criminal justice system. And QN was the contact for those people. And when you go to QN, I could also buy several subscriptions. So I subscribed, first of all, to QN's newspaper, which I have a huge collection of. And eventually, I hope some of that will get added to the Takazawa collection if you can tolerate my materials on top of what's already there. Um, but also, 
individual people who were on trial had their own little um, newsletter for the people who were following that trial. So I would subscribe to all these different newsletters and that stuff would just come to my house in Honolulu. And so nowadays I, I'm only subscribing to a couple of them that are left, but I have a huge reservoir of the kind of material that's in the Tagazawa collection, but he stopped collecting that in the early 90s. So I have it since then for those. Okay, so people who are, if, who are studying like popular magazines, they can go to a collection that has those magazines in Japan and they can make copies. But in my case, a lot of it was newsletters and you had to know those people and they had to trust you enough to let you subscribe to it. Um, but that's what I did. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, because I remember that uh, NCC has a multi-volume set grant. Yes. And uh, early as I came in, uh, joined the uh, University of Hawaii, you suggested that we should uh, get uh, you know, uh, Kaiho newspaper. Mm -hmm. And that was a very quite expensive pieces. Yes. Series. And uh, you suggested, you know, maybe we can actually apply for NCC multi volume mm -hmm. set grant. You remember that? <laughs> okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what motivated you to get involved in NCC and its activity? Because to me, is you already knew at that time about the NCC. NCC's mission and activities. Okay, that's another story. I, well, I assume that um, our former librarian is no longer on this earth, so it's okay to tell the story. Um, when I was running the Center for Japanese Studies, um, I knew Eric Gangor, um, of course, and um, Eric came to me and said, we're going to have a meeting to organize the Japanese librarians. And Eric told me that I needed to come to that meeting that he was organizing, which became the organizing meeting for the NCC. And he had asked me explicitly because he wanted the UH to be well represented. And if he just sent the librarian, that wouldn't happen. Uh. Okay, <laughs> so that's why I knew what was happening with NCC from the beginning. Okay, uh. but remember by then I had already done, um, I, when did NCC start? Uh, 1992, I believe. Okay, okay. <laughs> by then I had already done the first directory. So uh. I had already worked with and collected data from all the, the Japanese studies librarians. Okay, so I already, and I knew librarians were central, and I had those contacts, so I knew a fair number of them. Um, but at that time, a fair number of the Japanese librarians were actually the Chinese librarian in places where Chinese studies dominated. Okay, so who came to that thing was Japanese librarians, me, and a number of people who were overseeing a Japanese collection, but they were actually the Chinese library. Wow. Okay, and after that meeting, then things went off and I didn't have any more connection with it. But as NCC got developed, then I knew what it was and why it was important. Mm. So what activities and mission focus do you believe are necessary for an uh, organization like NCC to contribute? To the field. Frankly, I think NCC has done an absolutely marvelous job of figuring out what it can do and how it can contribute. And I would never have dreamed of half of the things that you've been doing. One example is the um, collection of um, art exhibition catalogs and all of that activity. Wow. I mean, you guys knew about that and somehow were able to organize it as a as a swap and a compare you know a, on both sides of the of the ocean um, 
and all of the stuff that you've done in terms of getting permissions for online for for citations all of that i mean you've done a terrific job and i can't tell you what your mission should be because you're doing it <laughs> that's great to hear <laughs> okay um it's often said that you know you mentioned that too on um, attitudes about research and what you know um, the use of library materials you mm -hmm. know there are more and more online resources yes. coming in and expectations of libraries and the librarians are changing you know that's yes. what we often hear yeah. so based on your own experience as a scholar what observations or advice might you share with new scholars and the librarians coming into the Japanese studies field? <sighs> <laughs> when I work with graduate students, which is where I would get it, um, I'm always encouraging them to be aware of all the different ways that they can learn about their topic. Um, as sociologists, they're usually oriented to participant observation and interviews, to direct contact with the people that they're studying. But often there is there's a, a library component, there's a background component to it. And it may not be the central focus, but it's something that is important for them to do. Nowadays, we also have, I've had students whose entire research is online because they're studying something about internet communications or whatever. So, you know, everything's changing. And I think after we come out of this pandemic, we're gonna be much more aware of the importance of things that are available online and of the way that people can meet and interact online because that's all we're doing these days. Um, and so, it becomes even more important that materials are available online. Now, a lot of things like the Takazawa collection materials are never going to be online in their entirety. So there has to be a repository and a way to preserve them. But it's also important that we use interlibrary loan and that we use online facilities as much as possible to deliver what's there to users. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. I'm not going to be around in the future, but the people who are doing it now and the people who are coming will figure it out. I have every confidence that you'll all succeed in your own way. Are there are any other messages that you would like to share with the next generation? Uh, I think they have to figure it out for themselves. Um, <laughs> but I think, as we said at the beginning, and as I said in my, um, my uh, retirement speech, um, it, part of it, yes, is having skills and developing the skills, the research skills or whatever, but a lot of it is just perceiving opportunities when they fall in your lap, okay? So being able to recognize an opportunity and build on it that's a skill in itself and that takes a certain amount of independence and i guess some it's a certain kind of research skill as well that you can see oh that's interesting and even if i'm not doing it now i'm gonna file it away and maybe collect some material so i can do something with that in the future so i think we have to be building those skills so that people are prepared and are can recognize an opportunity and move on it when it appears mm -hmm. okay um one comment from a librarian to you and i really appreciate what you've been doing is that you keep us informed even though i cannot do anything right this moment for example just like you said yeah. but you you know keep me informed and uh one time if i see something oh yes. this might you know <laughs> connect yeah. it with the takazawa collection then i can yeah. act on it 
So that's why I really appreciate you actually have, a, you have a very great uh, communication skills <laughs> and uh, keep us all informed. And so that in the future yeah. or sometimes, you know, that might come in yeah. handy. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's the openness that you have to, to do these kinds of things and to pick them up when they appear. Unfortunately, I don't think the Japan Foundation is going to support any more directories. Um, even though we had moved it online, um, they have not been at all responsive. And I think, in a sense, the field has gotten too big and it can't be managed. But I think they're going to see that they don't have the information they need because mm -hmm. they haven't supported it. But it is expensive. And I've been, you know, it's difficult to turn that over to somebody else because it is a, a complex package of skills. And so I was willing to keep doing it because it was, I could do it. And also because the surplus from that study also helped support the Takazawa collection at various times. So um, they're not going to have that in the future. And they may try to have something similar, but it won't be the same. So the end of an era <laughs> <laughs> well uh thank you so much and uh, we've been talking about your uh retirement lecture serendipity and sociology and ncc is going to link from you know this uh, interview to your <laughs> lecture as well because oh, nice. that is a wonderful wonderful um you know lecture that i learned a lot so i hope everybody can see and uh, read and oh, thank listen. you that's very kind thank you okay, so much. this has been fun as i expected because you asked very good questions so you're <laughs> a very good interviewer thank you so much <laughs>